Charging more for insurance just because pilots are old. Heartbreaking crash, we talk to the owners of the airline. A battle of float makers in Maine and a float plane saves the day. Plus, chatting it up about how we got this video. That and a lot more just after this. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Alyssa Cobb. Age is not pathology. What that means is that just because you're old, it doesn't mean that you're automatically incapable. But as so many of our AOPA members have discovered, that's not something that the aviation insurance companies seem to believe. What I'm having trouble with is with my personal airplane, <laughs> the Baron, and the Bonanza, it's doubled. And it's, they say it's because of age. Glenn says his insurance suddenly increased after he turned 70. He's 73 now, but is he a greater risk than he was three years ago? I'm an ATP rated pilot, and uh, I have uh, 25,000 hours, and uh, mostly that's jets. I go through recurrent training, get 6158 check. I have a first class physical. I'm in good health. Glenn is a contract pilot flying Hawkers and the Falcon 900 business jet, yet he's getting clobbered on insurance for his aircraft, and he's not alone. Pilots over 70 are finding their insurance much more expensive, and sometimes they're just canceled, even though they've never had an accident. Now, AOPA just surveyed some 30,000 pilots, and here's what we found. According to the survey responses, pilots over 70 are no more likely to have had an accident than younger pilots. Pilots over 70 actually average more flying hours per year than younger pilots, and they're more likely to have an instrument rating. So to put it bluntly, there is absolutely no data to show that at age 70 and one day, a pilot suddenly becomes an accident waiting to happen. So why have the insurance companies jacked their rates? Last five years, the aviation insurance community has lost $750 million in the general aviation space, and the insurers are looking for uh, ways to correct that. Uh, the general uh, consensus is in the insurance industry, when they lose, they raise rates. They look at area, uh, areas of their portfolio where they lose, where they've lost most money, and they concentrate on those areas the most. We don't believe they have correctly at old clients because we don't feel, and Mark Baker and I have had lengthy discussions on this topic, we don't believe that the data supports the increased pricing and tougher underwriting on older pilots. Now, Assured Partners is an insurance broker. They don't set the rates. They represent pilots and owners and seek the best rate from the insurance underwriters. AOPA and Assured Partners are working to find solutions to stabilize the market and promote new insurance carriers and options. AOPA is talking to state insurance officials to make sure consumer protection rules are being followed relative to aging pilots. And not that this helps right now, but do remember the insurance market is cyclical. There may be better news on the horizon. What we've seen in the past is after a year of profitability, they look inside their, their portfolios and see whether they've been draconian or not in, in various uh, elements of that portfolio. And could we relax the rules a little bit or, or the pricing? So hopefully we'll see that in 22 and 23. So Alyssa, mm -hmm. it's a very frustrating problem. Um, as I'm sure you see, we get comments all the time. I know that our mm -hmm. uh, call centers get calls literally every day from pilots who are experiencing these kind of challenges. And it's uh, very frustrating because again, many of them flown their entire career without an accident or an incident. And all of a sudden uh, they're considered this uh, insurance risk. That's right. And you know, it's something really we all need to be concerned about and working to help because eventually we're all gonna be there in the same boat. Yeah, that's right. 
Well, meanwhile, a tragic accident over the weekend. An Island Airways Britain Norman BN2A crashed before landing at Welk Airport, Welke Airport on Beaver Island in Michigan. Four people on the flight were killed, including the pilot. An 11-year-old girl is the sole survivor, and she is recovering at a hospital in Grand Rapids. There's not a lot of information about the accident yet. Island Airways provides scheduled service between the remote island in Lake Michigan and Charlevoix. Until now, Island Airways has been accident-free for its entire 76-year history. A few weeks ago, we were at Beaver Island to do a story on Island Airways, and we interviewed the owners of the airline. We operate 365 days a year. We even do a flight on Christmas to get the stragglers who missed everything else to get here. Um, the flight with us is about 15 minutes. What's your favorite part about your job? Just I guess just helping people. I think it's being part of this community, being based here, and just having, you know, that sense that we're all in this together. That's, that's pretty neat for me. So we have Senior Features Editor Julie Walker with us now, who interviewed the Welkies. So Julie, um, what's your impression from flying with the Island Airways folks and talking to them after the accident? Well, you know, one of the best things we get to do is meet all the people who fly and are part of aviation in this country. And um, Beaver Island, uh, Angel and Paul are just some of the kindest, just wonderful people. Um, I'm just devastated by this because they provide such um, an important uh, service right. to the island. There are only uh, 600 residents on the island. And in the winter, um, they provide all the food and produce and goods and chewy dog toys and <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and wine uh, <laughs> to um, the island and so and they care so much about the islanders and they are so much a part of the community um, I, it's it was it's a devastating thing I talked to Angel uh, last uh, right afterwards and they're just devastated uh, because they care so much for the community. Right, right, and it, it would be such a loss for that community if uh, something were to happen to that airline because of what you said. Oh, very much so. Uh, during the summer, there's a ferry that runs, but it's two and a half hours on the ferry, and of course, a lot of summer people come, but and some of the goods come across right. on the ferry, but in the winter, or fall and winter, and all the way into May, they get snow into May, mm. um, they, the Island Airways brings all those goods in, as well as they are the mail carrier, the FedEx carrier, the wow. Amazon carrier, and again, the Chewy to uh, dog toy important, carrier. Important for the dogs. Yeah. Okay, so. well, really, really sad story. I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more when the NTSB preliminary report comes out soon, and then ultimately when we get the final report, uh, which will probably take a couple of years, unfortunately. So uh, we'll wait to, to see what happens. But yeah. meanwhile, our sympathies to the whole community up there. It's a real loss. And to our prayers to Angel and Paul. Yeah. They're good people. Yeah. Definitely a heartbreaking story. Well, the N NTSB has released its preliminary finding on another accident on the private MD-87 that ran off the end of the runway. The aircraft burned, but thankfully, in this case, everyone got out okay. The crew reported that when they tried to rotate, they couldn't pull the yoke aft. The NTSB examination of the wreckage found the elevators jammed in the trailing edge down position. Control tab actuators were bent. Now, on this aircraft, there isn't a direct link from the cockpit yoke to the elevators. The elevators are positioned aerodynamically by the tabs, which is what the yoke actually controls. So in this case, moving the controls to check for freedom of movement may not have alerted the crew to a problem with the elevators. But for most of our general aviation aircraft, the controls free and correct check will catch a jam control surface or a rigging problem. Here's a tip on how to do the most complete control check. You know, a lot of pilots, when they get to that part of the checklist where it says flight controls free and correct, just sort of flop the controls a little bit and they say, yep, that's good enough. But Dave Hirschman taught me a technique which will ensure that you have full control authority when you're up in the air. And it's called boxing the controls. And it's really pretty simple. Take your control yoke or stick and push it full forward and then hard left, pull it straight back, then hard right, and then push it forward again. I'm describing, in essence, a box. And that ensures that you have 
completely free control movement. And the one other thing that I like to do, just before taking the runway, I check the killer items. Fuel, trim, mixture, flaps, mags, master. Just one final check before we add the power and soar off into the blue. Well, next week, the crazy begins, the start of the holiday travel season, and the experts predict that traffic will be up to more than 100% from last year, which was well, conveniently a relatively low threshold. Delays on the roads, delays at the airline airports, and delays for you if you fly IFR. So each year when we get into the holiday season, uh, we run across uh, some iteration of air traffic delays, particularly along the East Coast and a few other places in the country, uh, most notably the Colorado Ski Country airports. The fact of the matter is, the reality is that there are just simply too many aircraft trying to share the same airspace or the same uh, space at airports at the same time. Now, Jim spent more than a decade inside the FAA's Air Traffic Control System Command Center, so he has a pretty good idea of what you can do to min minimize your IFR delays. Get your flight plan in the system as early as possible. Uh, what a lot of uh, folks do is that they tend to wait until the morning before they are going to fly to, to get their flight plan in the system. And what can actually help you is if you can get your, your, your plan in perhaps the night before, sometime the day before. What this does, it, it's not going to eliminate your delay, but what it, it allows FAA to see your flight ahead of time, and it becomes par, uh, part of what we call known demand, so that FAA can take your flight into account along with a lot of others as they're crafting their plans, routes, delay programs, things like that for the next day. Some more tips. Avoid the congested routes along the East Coast. They get really backed up over the holidays. Fly early in the day before the airlines crank up. Fly below 12,000 feet to avoid some traffic management programs. And you can find more information at filesmart.org. And one other thing, don't try to take off VFR and pick up your clearance in the air. Yeah, it's legal, but controllers hate it when they're really busy. They just might spin you in a hold at some point to work you into their traffic flow. Just saying. And if you're looking to get away from crowded airspace, there's nothing better than flying a seaplane. A seaplane is the ultimate backcountry machine, opening access to countless bodies of water across the country. And there are several companies that make airplane floats. AOPA Editor-at-Large Dave Hersman compares two from Maine with very different methods for making their products. There are two companies in Maine that produce floats for amphibious seaplanes, and they could hardly be more different. PK Floats takes its name from its founder's initials, and it's a time-tested firm located in the rural central part of the state. It takes a traditional approach in which skilled craftsmen make aluminum floats by hand in a homey hangar overseen by Molly, a very chill Labrador retriever. They're tough, they're rugged, um, and it is a lot of hand skill. PK makes floats for both FAA standard category airplanes as well as experimental models. Our aluminum floats uh, for this particular model of the 185 are lighter than our competitors, almost 100 pounds lighter. Aluminum is light, it's tough, it's rugged, it lasts. And, uh, you know, we are big believers in aluminum, just like those boys that flew those B-17s. Claymore is a younger firm in coastal Brunswick that's all about new materials and technology. Workers use composite materials cooked in autoclaves to produce rugged floats they say will never leak or rust. Composites have the advantage of having free form in terms of the, the form that we can uh, build our floats from. So it's a molded operation. So our floats tend to be very smooth shaped, aerodynamic, hydrodynamic. That, that manifests itself in hull shapes where we use fluted bottoms, which enhances their takeoff performance on the water. Uh, they are very strong and very important attribute is they're very light. All of Claymore's floats are made for experimental aircraft. People like air cams, non-certificated LSAs, people who are building those airplanes and operating those airplanes. Claymore installs some of the latest safety technology in its floats, such as tiny radar altimeters that tell pilots their height above the water and it has warning systems that tell pilots if their landing gear is in the proper position for land or water touchdowns. We see opportunities for innovation and we've implemented in 
uh, systems on the float. So our gear systems, for instance, we've gone completely away from hydraulics. We're all electric actuators. We're implementing microprocessor-based electronics into our gear retraction and alerting systems. PK emphasizes old school pilot training to avoid those kinds of mishaps. We're, we're in the forefront of safety. Insurance rates are, are really squeezing float plane pilots, especially amphib pilots. We need to be safer as a group. You know, the cockpit awareness that so many people are adopting in training, we need it in seaplanes. One thing these very different enterprises do agree on is that seaplane flying opens a new world of exploration and excitement to pilots who seek it out. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. You can read more about these two manufacturers in an upcoming issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. And back in just a sec, we'll talk about this video. And then profile the Octopus Flying Club. Are you thinking about selling your airplane? I'm Kevin Tracy, and I owned one of the largest advertising agencies north of Boston, and I'm the former VP of Marketing at Piper. I know airplanes and I know advertising. Go to TwinAirAviation.com to learn more about how I can help you sell your airplane. Hello. You're on guard. Hello. Well, enough is enough already. Between the meows and the let's go Brandon's guard, the 121.5 emergency frequency has become jam packed with people fooling around. Many pilots and air traffic controllers are starting to speak out about the safety problem this is creating. It's listened to by every FAA and air traffic facility and provides immediate access to help any pilot in range. But if chuckleheads with a middle school mentality are busy making animal sounds or political chants, the frequency could be jammed for someone who needs it. So cut it out, seriously. I'm speaking to you as a pilot and a CFI, but don't make me use my mom voice. <laughs> we don't want your mom voice. Hey, speaking of emergencies, an Icon aircraft employee was able to help rescue the pilot and passenger of a Mooney that landed in the water off the coast of Tampa. Janessa Duffy is the chief pilot for Icon. She was on a return to service flight testing an A-5 that had been in for maintenance when she heard a Mooney had landed in the water short of Peter Owen Knight Airport in Tampa, Florida. She immediately rushed to help. Once I got there, I saw the aircraft was completely submerged in, in the water. I started looking for people. I saw that the life vest that was completely inflated um, and I did one more circle just to make sure there was no other cluster of people that I might um, hit. I think I might have made a radio call saying that I was going to land and assist uh, or see if I could assist. Um, once I touched down in the water, I was a little bit further away from them. I shut down. I opened up the canopy and I set up. I asked them if they were OK. Um, and then uh, they said, yeah, they were both fine. The current was too strong, though, and they couldn't actually get towards the, the aircraft. So I started back up and I got closer and kind of in front of them. And then when I shut down, I was able to kind of uh, glide back towards them. Everyone was OK. Janessa was just happy to be in the right place to help her fellow pilot. There's some irony we noted here. Janessa's Instagram handle is I got your six. And this situation shows that, yeah, she really does. So uh, kind of a good news story. Sorry to, that that Mooney had an accident, but it's great that, uh, that she was in the neighborhood to help. Hey, that's right. Really remarkable. Yeah. Sustainable aviation fuel is a cleaner blend of jet fuel made from renewable and waste resources. And it just powered a big chopper. The Bell 525 Relentless has flown on SAF. The long-range twin-engine helicopter is in flight testing. And it's lights out at Sun and Fun. John Light's Leanhouts has led the organization since 2012, and he's planning to retire after the 2022 event. Lights is credited with helping craft Sun and Fun from the fun spring break for pilots into an event that focuses on aviation's future. Under his leadership, Sun and Fun added STEM aerospace education for young people through the Aerospace Center for Excellence. Congratulations, Lights. A big honor for our boss, AOPA President and CEO Mark Baker. He's been awarded an honorary membership in the First Flight Society. He joins aviation historian and curator Dr. Tom Crouch and aerobatic superstar Rob Holland in this year's class. First Flight Society commemorates the first flight of the Wright brothers and their development of powered flight. Each year, the society recognizes individuals and entities that have accomplished outstanding achievements in manned flight and their contributions to aviation. Well, after you get your certificate, it's not too long before flying around your local airport can get a little boring. 
The problem is, if you don't own an airplane, it can be challenging to plan a longer trip if you rent from your local flight school. That's one major advantage of flying clubs. Clubs give you access to a wide variety of airplanes and are less restrictive than flight schools. We caught up with a couple who joined the Octopus Flying Club in Maryland for their adventures around the country. I'm Samantha Bryant. And I'm Jason Kober, and we're both active with Octopus Flying Club. So Octopus in Maryland is based out of Gaithersburg Airport. They have three aircraft. They have the Cicada TB-20, uh, the Cicada TB-200, and a Piper PA-28 Archer. So we had, well, we both own a Cessna 120, and we travel in that quite a bit. We'll take it all over. Uh, we took it down to Florida uh, one summer. For that plane, it's good for 90% of the stuff that we do, but we wanted a plane that could go faster, so that's why we started looking at clubs. We found this particular club because of high-performance aircraft. This is a 1998 uh, Cicada TB20. Uh, it's a high-performance uh, retract aircraft. Got the Lycoming IO540. This one's equipped with the Garmin G500 and the, the GTN 650. It's also got a uh, three-axis autopilot. So it's a really nice, nicely equipped cross-country aircraft. Uh, in May, we just took this down to Key West, mm -hmm. Florida, yeah. but we stopped along the way. So we stopped in Charleston, yeah. Jekyll Island in Georgia. Then we went to Spruce Creek mm -hmm. uh, down in Daytona, Florida. Yeah. And then we went down to Key West and then we came back up the coast, stopped at Cedar Key, which was neat, mm -hmm. and Savannah, yep. and then back home. So I earned my private pilot's license back in November of 2020. It's been really exciting getting to see uh, what a high performance plane is like and um, the glass panels. Those are things that you really just don't get in flight school planes. You know, I haven't met a lot of other female pilots like myself, especially at my flight school, there weren't a lot of other female student pilots. So getting to join the flying club there's a lot of other people that share the same love for aviation as mm -hmm. we do, so that's really the most exciting part for me is just to meet other people that love to fly yeah. and travel and explore new places. Well, you can find the Flying Club near you on the AOPA Flying Club website. Our team at the High Sierra Fly-In got some really great content. You've seen a lot of it in recent weeks, and there's more to come. This week, Paul Harrop and Kevin Cortez talk about how one of the shoots there came together at the last second. What's up, man? What up? <laughs> so I was looking back through this footage that we got at High Sierra, and I was pretty pleased with that uh, very spontaneous <laughs> truck to air shoot we did with Colin Caneva. Yeah, very spontaneous. Sorry about like knocking you off the truck a couple it's, times. It's all good. It's all good. Well, so if folks haven't seen it, let's take a look at it here. This is Colin Caneva and his carving cub, and he's formed up on our camera and. Uh, that is uh, literally Kevin driving a pickup truck and me in the back of it shooting. Uh, we've actually got this 360 video of it. Take a look at, at kind of the setup there. And, you know, this all came together pretty quickly. What, what do you remember about how we, we put it together and briefed it? Yeah, I remember you said you wanted to do it. Uh, and we were in the truck and we were driving by Colin at the time. I was like, hey, we gotta, we'll talk to Colin about doing this. What's up? You want to see on a carbon cup? You want to do what? You want to fly on a carbon cup? Yeah. Yeah, I you knew him. him. Yeah, I knew him from uh, Mayday Soul from back in uh, Nebraska. So that was uh, that was how I knew Colin. But yeah, it was good to uh, to brief it with him right before because he was going to go flying anyways. So uh, yeah, he, he immediately agreed, which I thought was really cool and. Uh, I just remember him saying, like, you know, you know, we're talking about our, how we would bail out in case something went wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But he's just like, just nail, stay at 60. We'll be good to go. I'll be able to fly around you guys. And uh, I was just making sure we were at 60 and you weren't falling off. Uh, I didn't want to brake too hard or accelerate too hard. That was a little rough. Well, and that truck, it was a little, you know, it took some finesse to do it. And I think we should be clear. I mean, I was harnessed in. I treated this like I oh, yeah. air to air. I had a... <laughs> A tree stand harness on and a line going back to the. It just looks so funny, man. The seat rail of the truck. Yeah, I could not physically depart the pickup bed, so the only real risk there was either A, Colin chopping me to bits with the prop, which I trusted him not to do, or B, 
you flip in the truck, which would be really hard to do on a flat lake bed. So we briefed it, we talked about it, and then we just met up. And so what what was it like for you to drive a truck and be essentially a platform ship for a a truck to air shoot? Yeah, I think it was pretty cool. It was was wild, right? Because I didn't realize, like, how far out the lake bed goes. So you can be going on forever at, like, 60. So that was cool getting used to that, just picking a point and going to it at 60. And the craziest part, I think, like I knew what we were doing and we were getting into, but like seeing him in the rear view mirrors was like, oh, dang, that's happening. Yeah, it's got a hedgehog there with an airplane chasing you. And so I should I should say I've done this before. I did this a couple years ago at High Sierra. Uh, my buddy Carl drove the truck and uh, Corey Robin formed up on us there. And really, uh, I, I got to give credit. I don't think there's such thing as an original idea anymore. Uh, this was an evolution of an idea I had seen uh, Leonardo Correa Luna do. Uh, but what uh, what I took from him, he had the dust trail going and the truck uh, coming straight away from the airplanes. And I think the way to sell the magic in this was to not let the truck be known. Not to let the dust trail, not to let the shadow to where you just formed up, the cameras just formed up on this airplane. Yeah. And to me, selling the magic of that shot is not revealing how you're getting it to the viewers. I don't know, what do you what do you think? No, I think that is pretty cool. That angle would be awesome because it leaves, like, was it a drone? Was it another plane flying lower? I think that, that was cool. Um, but just from driving and being there, the coolest part was him cruising through the dust behind us, right? And like, yeah. Shot. That was pretty insane. You can explore the 360 video from that shoot for yourself right now on our AOPA Live YouTube channel. So Alyssa, pretty, some pretty amazing stuff with the technology for those 360 cams is pretty cool. That's right, it would have been cool to have been part of it. <laughs> yeah, what a great venue too. And that's it this week. Like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell for us. Or send us an email. Either way, we're grateful to hear from you.